You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for April 1st, 2022. This week, feedback on a coronary CTA question, semaglutide, coronary artery calcium and sudden cardiac death, exercise as medicine, and an ACC and European Heart Rhythm Association meeting preview. Now, the first topic today is some reader feedback on coronary CT imaging. A practicing non-invasive general cardiologist from the U.S. wrote to me and said he was a loyal listener and self-described medical conservative, but he had serious criticism of my, quote, generally negative approach to cardiac CT. Quote, every time a positive cardiac CT trial comes out, you tend to focus on the negative aspects of it and forget to include the positive outcomes, end quote. In his email, he listed a number of ways that CTA helps him in his practice. For instance, he wrote that CTA is a good test for reassurance. It's akin to an electrophysiologist ordering a cardiac monitor for the benign palpitations. When the test is normal, anxious people with atypical chest pain can become less anxious. He also listed the advantages of CTA over functional stress testing. He wrote that CTA can identify left main disease, can put the brakes on revascularization. Quote, I have had multiple patients who are identified obstructive plaque on the cardiac CT and they have minimal angina or atypical chest pains that we pursue medical therapy with anti-anginal therapy as well as optimal medical therapy for reducing the risk. CTA can induce positive lifestyle changes, he wrote, in patients with lower intermediate risk lesions. And he also noted that other countries are using it as a first-line test. Okay, so my comments on this. First, I love notes like this. Thank you. It was strong but respectful criticism. And that a busy clinician took time to write such a detailed response to the podcast really moved me. I mean, criticism these days is absolutely necessary, and I remind everyone of one of my favorite writers, the late Christopher Hitchens, his famous quote in his book, Letters to a Young Contrarian. He wrote, oddly enough, time spent in argument is time hardly ever wasted, and I couldn't agree more with that. Okay, on his first point, using tests for reassurance, I worry a lot about this. To my young listeners out there, you should be very careful. Almost never order a test when you're hoping it will be negative. Now, of course, as a pragmatic practicing doctor, it is true that I occasionally order monitors to reassure people. But I would argue that a cardiac monitor ordered by an electrophysiologist who knows the patient has less risk of starting a downstream cascade of tests than an imaging test of the heart. Now, my colleague tells of CTA putting the brakes on revascularization. I've had a different experience, and the data speak otherwise. First, I've seen CTAs lead quickly to angiography and revascularization, if not immediately, but later. For example, I've seen patients develop symptoms once they learn of having an unstented stenosis. What's more, imaging tests find spots, incidental lomas, for instance. And it happened to me. I had an abdominal CT for another reason, and come to find out, the cardiac slices showed a small node in my epicardial fat. Now, this caused and still causes me angst. For instance, A, why do I have epicardial fat? I'm a cyclist, for Pete's sake. And B, despite numerous radiologists reassuring me that it's likely benign, I'm worried I'd be healthier had I not known about this spot. Now, as for CTA being superior to stress testing, I don't 
Agree exactly. And here I can cite a meta-analysis and systematic review that I co-authored with the Penn State group led by Andrew Foy. And I will link to it. It's in JAMA Internal Medicine. What we found is that of 13 trials comparing CTA versus stress testing in patients with chest pain, there was no difference in death or cardiac hospitalizations. Now, CTA did lead to a 0.4% absolute risk reduction in MI, but this finding was sensitive to inclusion of the Scott Hart trial, which we did not feel was fair to include because Scott Hart was not a direct comparison of CTA versus stress testing. Remember that Scott Hart compared CTA and stress testing to stress testing alone, but of course we lost that peer review battle. We also found that CTA led to more coronary diagnoses, uh, invasive coronary angiography, and more revascularization. Now, finally, I don't mean to defend low-value stress testing, of which there is way too much. And if CTA was used by thoughtful doctors, like the one who wrote to me, or, say, Mark Dweck or Nicholas Mills in Scotland, we'd have a lot less overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And, of course, I'll close with my mentor, Bill Miles, what he taught me. He always said, Mandrola, you shouldn't be against the test or treatment. Rather, it is the unwise use of these tests and treatments that you should criticize. Okay, next topic, semaglutide. This week, the FDA has approved a higher 2 milligram dose of this glucagon-like peptide 1 agonist semaglutide for adults with type 2 diabetes. Remember that semaglutide is an injection and has been available for some time in 0.5 and 1 milligram doses. Last summer, the Lancet Diabetes Journal published the results of the sustained forte trial of 2 milligrams versus 1 milligram semaglutide. The higher dose resulted in a greater reduction in hemoglobin A1c and a greater weight loss. Now, I realize that cardiologists have not, now note the past tense, been familiar with diabetes drugs. But, but increasingly, I find myself thinking about diabetes drugs and regimens. Recently, I had a patient with an ICD and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and diabetes and was on three diabetes meds and was not on an SGLT2 inhibitor. So I called the primary conditions and they were like, yeah, yeah, he should be on DAPA or EMPA. So semaglutide has two connections to cardiovascular space. One is at the Sustained 6 Cardiovascular Outcomes Trial. Published in New England in 2016, semaglutide resulted in a lower rate of cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, versus placebo in high-risk patients with diabetes. So it has positive cardiovascular outcomes. The other connection to cardiology is that semaglutide 2.4 milligram dosing has been shown to induce weight loss in patients with obesity. Last year, New England published a step one trial showing a significant and sustained weight loss with semaglutides. FDA has subsequently approved this dose. Now, this melding of cardiology with diabetes reminds me of why I love cardiology and EP especially. That is, you first have to be a good clinician. Yes, of course, many of us are attracted by the procedures. And procedures are nice, but procedures are far easier to learn than being a good clinician. You know, young people may think this sounds funny, but I'll just tell you, over the years, procedures can actually get a little boring. Electrophysiology is great because half the week you do procedures and the other half you do doctoring. And I love the challenge of learning new ways to treat patients with conditions. I am no diabetic specialist, I know that, but I want to know enough to help my cardiac patients get the best approach to all the conditions that could affect their heart health. And guess what? That includes just about every condition. All right, next topic is coronary artery calcium and sudden cardiac death. The journal Jack Imaging just published an observational study on the association of coronary artery calcium with future risk of sudden cardiac death. Now, this paper will also be presented at the ACC meeting. A group of authors, many of them on the record as being CAC proponents, studied more than 66,000 patients from the CAC Consortium, which is a cohort study from four high-volume U.S. centers. Now, for this study, the patients are included if they had a CAC score and were free of known heart disease or symptoms. 
They were then followed, and sudden cardiac death was assessed by linking patients with Social Security Administration records and National Death Index. The risk factors for heart disease got assessed at the time of the CAC scan. About 55% of these 66,000 had more than a zero calcium score. Over 10 years, they tallied 211 sudden deaths. Now, that sounds like a lot, but remember, that is an incidence of 0.3% if you divide 211 by 66,000 patients. The investigators then made five categories. CAC 0, which was the reference, then CAC 1 to 99, 100 to 399, 400 to 999, and greater than 1,000. And the main results were that compared to the reference, CAC 0, there was a stepwise higher risk in sudden cardiac death depending on how much calcium you had. If it was 100 to 399, the risk was 2.8 times higher. If it was 400 to 999, it was four times higher, and greater than 1,000, it was 4.9 times higher. Now, these risks were adjusted for basic risk factors. The coronary calcium score also provided incremental improvements in the C statistic for the prediction of sudden cardiac death, especially among individuals with a lower 10-year CV risk. Now, the incremental improvement in the C statistic was statistically significant, but it was very small. And the authors concluded, and here's the problem, they concluded higher CAC burden strongly associates with incident sudden cardiac death beyond traditional risk factors, particularly among primary prevention patients with low to intermediate risk. But that's not all. They also concluded, quote, SCD risk stratification can be useful in the early stages of coronary heart disease through the measurement of CAC, identifying patients most likely to benefit from further downstream testing. That part is really problematic. I want to take a deep breath. You know, you know how I feel about CAC. I am not a proponent for this test. But this conclusion is really, really problematic. SCD risk stratification can be useful through the measurement of CAC, identifying patients most likely to benefit from further downstream testing. And the news headline read, Calcium score predicts sudden death risk in preclinical CAD in a large cohort study. I would not use these causal constructions in this retrospective, non-randomized, convenient sample of patients from four centers. You can't make these sorts of conclusions from this study. Now, first of all, and I think most importantly, the absolute rate of sudden cardiac death in this decade, in a decade, was 0.3%. And when event rates are that uncommon, it's hard to say much about modifying risk factors, even if the data were stronger. Second, I would point out that 19 human beings with a CAC zero died suddenly. That is 10%, 1 in 10 of the 211 sudden cardiac deaths. And third, as the authors write, quote, multiple imputation was performed on 28% of individuals who had missing data on atherosclerotic risk factors. So, my friends, nearly a third of the patients had missing data on risk factors that surely impact sudden cardiac death risk. Fourth, there are many factors that influence both coronary artery calcium and sudden cardiac death risk, so there's a huge risk of confounding. Okay, you can argue with me about CAC usage to help statin decision-making in medium-risk individuals. I think I have the winning side, but at least there's an argument. But if you cite this sort of data to say you can predict sudden cardiac death or identify patients most likely to benefit from downstream testing, I am going to really fight you on it hard. Now, why does this rile me up so much? Because the main problem I have with using CAC is that it leads to disease creation and serious increases in downstream testing, which surely benefits doctors and hospitals far more than patients. These sort of conclusions give a tacit approval for what happens nearly every day in my zip code, and that is high calcium scores does not only lead to statin prescriptions, but a hotline to the nuclear stress camera and or the cath lab. All right, next topic, exercise. Exercise in COVID-19 infection. 
The British Journal of Sports Medicine published an observational study from a South African research group studying the association between physical activity and getting severe COVID-19. Now, this topic piques my interest because, one, I love endurance exercise, and two, it is very rare to see fit runners and cyclists who got ARDS during the pandemic. I mean, I did an informal poll of our hospitalists and ICU docs, and, and none of them could remember any serious athlete who had severe ARDS. I'm also in a community of 300 cyclists here in our e-group, and n no one I know of has been admitted to an ICU for COVID-19. Of course, make no mistake, I am sure somewhere some people have seen an elite athlete, cyclist, or runner get severe COVID-19 disease. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I just It just seems to be very rare. So the South African authors collected data from about 65,000 patients who had a COVID-19 diagnosis, and then they grouped them by activity level, low, moderate, and high levels of physical activity. Then they did regression, aka correlation. And when you compare high versus low physical activity, there was a 34% lower risk for hospitalization and high activity, a 41% lower risk for ICU admission, and a 42% lower risk for death. Superstar journalist Patrice Wendling has coverage on the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and she smartly cites in her news coverage similar data from both the U.S. and South Korean cohort studies. This paper has all the normal caveats of retrospective observational comparisons, including confounding. That is, people who have high levels of exercise may be healthier in many other ways and also likely have a higher socioeconomic status. But here, here's my thinking. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. There seems to be something uncanny with SARS-CoV-2 in that many of the risk factors for cardiovascular disease were also strong risk factors for getting severe COVID. Obesity, diabetes, hypertension, all seem to be risk factors for COVID-19. Well, people who exercise a lot, I mean a lot, don't have a lot of these risk factors. So at least there's this plausibility that the association between exercise and less severe COVID could be at least partially causal. Now, the other reason I mention this study is that I think exercise is underprescribed. I bet I prescribe regular daily exercise five, six, seven times every clinic. I liken it to a heart pill or an AFib pill. Do a little exercise every day that you eat is what I say. Seriously, I really do think that it's like a prevention pill. And I don't know how successful I am with this, but I, the framing as exercise as medicine seems right to me. Okay, next topic is an ACC preview. I leave for the American College of Cardiology meeting in Washington, D.C. this morning, just a few hours after I taped this podcast. I wrote an ACC preview column. Steve Stiles wrote a better one. They are both up on the heart.org Medscape Cardiology webpage. I think the biggest news of the meeting will have to be that it is happening in person. Yes, there will be some virtual parts of the meeting, but more than 12,000 people have registered as in person. This is such a big deal for the U.S. It's been a very hard two years, and just walking the convention halls and going to dinner with colleagues will be such a wonderful thing. I look forward to walking past the posters, as it should be. Now, it's really hard to say what study will emerge as the biggest one from ACC. The lead study is on Mava Campton for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Will it reduce the need for septal reduction therapy? The Valor randomized controlled trial on Mavacamptan was powered for a 50% reduction in the primary endpoint at 16 weeks. So that makes it vulnerable to a type 2 error. But on the other hand, I'm seeing lots of ads for the drug. So we'll just have to wait and see what the trial results are. Another late breaker tests the old notion of salt restriction for heart failure. I would not be surprised if another dogma in medicine fails the RCT test. There's also an arrhythmia-centric session of featured research, but keep in mind also that the European Heart Rhythm Meeting starts Sunday in Copenhagen, and you can bet there will be tons of arrhythmia news coming from that meeting. And I, I guess what's up with having two great meetings overlap, ERA and ACC? I hope that changes in the future. So the next two to three podcasts here will include recaps of both these excellent meetings, and of course there'll be lots to say about the studies presented.
And if you're in Washington, D.C., I hope you say hello to me. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listen. Thank you. And remember, friends, if you like this podcast, please give us a rating. Write us a little review. It really helps others find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.